the talk is going to be a little bit different. While it definitely has an aviation theme, it's going to be very much more of a human interest story about the, uh, a young man from a backcountry farm born to fly. Uh, so it's going to be focused on the wartime experiences that my father had. So we'll be focusing on the period of 1930, or thereabouts, to, to 1945. And um, uh, before I start, I just thought I'd get us in the vibe a wee bit. Now, um, I mentioned about the technology. We've got a lovely big speaker here to get a nice sound. But despite all of the configuration and the computer doing everything else, the moment we stick the PowerPoint on, the sound comes through the little speaker up above you. So this is the view that Dad would have spent a lot of his time flying. There's a hidden switch. <laughs> Okay, so most of the material that I'll be presenting tonight comes from a little short autobiography that my father wrote. Uh, he did this in 1998, and he did it all on his own, despite having five sons, um, uh, one who was, I think, the PR manager for Westpac in uh, Australia, uh, and other sons with technical um, skills. Uh, he did this all on his own with the help of the local secretarial service and um, uh, 1990 uh, in Tupuki, sorry, around 1998, and presented it to us as a Christmas present. Um, the title has a slight poignant note for me because I was born with a congenital heart defect, which meant that I was born not to fly. Uh, and before you, anyone worries, um, the surgeons at Green Lane Hospital eventually fixed it up in 1986, but by then I had a wife and family and a growing electronics business and no money. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, three of my brothers completed their PPLs and uh, one actually joined the Air Force, Morris. He joined as a boy entrant with um, a couple of the members not here tonight. Um, back in uh, around 60, 62, I think it was, 62, 63. Anyway, um, uh, that's my uh, dad and my mum, and for those of you who know the family, my mum was a very accomplished artist. I'll talk about her later, because she forms part of the story. Um, dad's um, birth certificate, and of course the marriage certificate, if nothing else, just to verify that I ain't a bastard. <laughs> um, dad's um, father was a farmer out of Pongakawa, um, his uh, grandfather, Albert, was the postmaster at Makatu when Mount Tarawira erupted. Um, and um, his mother, was great, uh, my grandmother Helen, came from uh, Nelson. And her father was also a postmaster. So it's no coincidence that I started my career in the post office. He um, went to um, high school for one year and then left work to work on the farm, which was not uncommon in those days, um, particularly as um, they were in the Depression years by that time. But he would have been about 13 years of age when the bug hit, and by the bug I mean the aviation bug, and he um, got hold of Model Air, which was operating then and still operates today, and um, was making model uh, aeroplanes. But um, from there, he moved on to something bigger. Now, in my subsequent slides, um, my son has very kindly voiced my father talking about his experience. My next try was with a full-size plane of some 15 feet wingspan. It was a bamboo frame, roughly the shape of a plane with wings and a tail. Underneath was part of a pram with wheels. 
I had no knowledge of aerofoils and it was just covered with opened manure bags. My aim was to rush to the edge of a hill and hang underneath as it glided across our big gully. My parents kindly came along to witness the spectacle. By the time I'd tumbled head over tail several times, I was black and blue and trying to keep a stiff upper lip. Mum and Dad were very kind and wished me better luck next time. In 28 or 29, Kingsford Smith came to New Zealand as one of his visits. And he went to Rotorua and Dad hitched a ride. Unfortunately, it was with a milk truck or something, cream, cream lorry, something like that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, by the time he arrived, all he saw was the Southern Cross heading off back to Auckland. And just as a little aside, on my wife's side of the family, uh, with respect to Kingsford Smith, uh, in '33, when he landed, uh, this is Kingsford Smith, um, he uh, uh, went into a drain and the plane went like that. Uh, the wing broke and the propeller broke. Anyway, uh, my wife's grandfather, a guy called Bill Heald, was a builder and he was contracted to build a new propeller, which he did. But out of the old one, he made this inkwell. Okay. So, and there's an inscription on the back, made from the propeller of Kingsford Smith Southern Cross for Gloria Equal, which is my um, mother-in-law, late mother-in-law. So, that, that sits on our shelf at home. Um, there was actually a photo downstairs. It, I went to look for it, and apparently it's whoever does all of the window, the dressing, all the photos, they took it away. But there was a photo of uh, a whole group of people with Kingswood Smith uh, standing um, beside the Southern Cross and there was a picture of a man with a baby and we believe that was Bill and my mother-in-law when she was like five years old. So I'm trying to find out where that, uh, where that went to. Anyway, um, yeah, there's the plane being uh, repaired. The next attempt was, um, had greater potential to get flying and it was a... Actually, there's, there is something French here. And excuse my pronunciation, uh, Jan, but um, Le Pou de Seal? Seal. Ah, close, close. Which means the flying flea. And uh, uh, it was going to cost about £160, which for a family in the Depression was quite a lot, but somehow Dad had convinced him and, and perhaps his uh, grandfather to, to chip in something. But before it got delivered, um, they found out that you could not get or you could not recover from a spin. And so it was banned in the UK and hence uh, New Zealand. So that, that didn't happen. But along came the war. In 1939, um, he wrote to the Air Department uh, asking to train as a pilot. And they told him he had to have matriculation and a whole lot of university study and so on. But he applied anyway. This is what happened. I had no knowledge of trig or algebra. I was interviewed by a very nice gentleman who I am forever grateful to, and when I told him I was flying mad for as long as I could remember, he put me down for the pilot's course, but warned that I would have to study hard. I went back to milking cows and digging drains and haymaking, but with a new purpose in life. It took two years of hard slog with the well-known 21 assignment correspondence course, even finishing it on my honeymoon. So this is the course book. Now, I did two years of mathematics at university, all right? When I opened this up, I went, you know, the S word. Um, for a person with only one year of high school to tackle this um, was an amazing feat, which he completed um, and um, uh, was um, finally accepted. But that wasn't his only challenge. Um, he had um, other influences. Um, from one side, his uh, grandmother was very uh, supportive and, um, you know, sort of didn't think as a farmer he should, but he went anyway. On the other side, an interesting grandmother. Um, this is um, Martha 
well, she's Martha Benner, obviously, but she, her father was in the 58th Regiment that came to New Zealand in 1846. They were actually guards on the prison ships going out to Australia. And when they had the unrest up in Northland, they came across and he fought at Okaihau and uh, Ruapekapeka Pass. Pretty vicious fighting. And um, later, when they were finished, uh, the family went back to England and then on to India. So somewhere in that um, experience, she wasn't so convinced about um, the, whether Vern should go uh, overseas. But in the end, he decided to go. Um, I think, one, obviously, uh, a desire to serve his country, but also the secret desire to get to fly. And fly he did. Anyway, somewhere along the way, he met my mother, Renee. Their family had been living in Rotoahu uh, on a government scheme to grow tobacco as part of the Depression years. I met my wife, Renee, and for the first time ever was absolutely certain that this was exactly what I wanted and pursued this lady with the same vigour used in my quest for wings. So they got married in 1941, and um, just looking at the photograph, for some reason motorbikes have figured in our family, and I wasn't quite sure it was the bikes or the goggles or whatever. But Dad told stories of riding at 80 miles an hour along gravel roads. You know, And I've done a bit of biking in my life, but I'd never go that far. Anyway, after passing all of the required tests, he uh, boarded a train to the um, initial training wing, which they held in um, Levin. We were fitted with smart uniforms with the white flash and the cap denoting aircrew under training, commonly called pupes. In addition to long hours of study, there was much drilling and marching. Sergeant Robbie, a red-headed tyrant, slowly made us into a disciplined troop who could turn on a wing parade to be proud of. Now, many of the trainees were university graduates, and um, for a 24-year-old farmer, you know, it wasn't so easy, and they had to work into the small hours, uh, working with each other to, um, to learn um, the uh, topic. For um, my mother, it was a different story, and um, uh, here I've had the help of a, a friend in, in the film business to... Um, to, to give uh, Renee's view. I joined some of the wives staying at a boarding house in Levin. Our husband spent the weekends with us for another 10 shillings. We made lifelong friends. It was a long train journey down there and I could never sleep. What with the stoppages and the people coming and going, it was very noisy. One could hire a pillow. So this is the graduation from um, Levin. And from there, um, got moved to Fanuapai to the um, elementary uh, flight training school. Fanuapai, with its huge hangars full of bright yellow tiger moths, were all stinking of dope. I can still remember the excitement tinged with fear that the smell of dope engenders. At Fanuapai, he encountered the Lynx trainer, um, same as what um, we've got down here. The Lynx was a flight simulator. Very realistic, but safer than flying if you crashed. Unfortunately, I left it a bit late and hit the top wire, scattering batons in all directions. The tiger kept flying, but it earned me the nickname of Crash Benner, and that name stayed with me until I was renamed Killer Benner at Ohakia. I got that name because I was slower than others at landing into the wind and kept crossing other people's flight path. I never had anybody, but my mates had to be agile. At um, Whanuapai, um, they learned to fly um, Hawker Hines and uh, Hearts, and um, they spent about six weeks learning to fly the planes and then getting into gunnery and um, um, uh, fighting tactics. The Hind was a wonderful plane to fly, rather like a powerful sports car in the air. The only problem was that they were a 1932 vintage in X desert resulting in frequent motor problems. He also had a couple of incidences there as well. <laughs> um, the first was when he was sent up to do some aerobatics and um, there was a cloud base of 1,000 feet and was solid to 10,000. Anyway, he had just broken the cloud at the top and there was a loud bang and the motor stopped. 
I came back to the reciprocal course, and to my relief, Wahakia was within gliding distance. In his second incident, um, he was returning from a high altitude exercise, sort of fast, and he started experiencing extreme pains in his head. Afraid that I might lose consciousness, I gave it heaps, banged the plane down and rushed to the medical centre. I had done the wrong thing. My sinuses had not kept pace with the rapid descent and subsequent change in air pressure. Anyway, they assembled the whole course the next day to explain the predicament. Um, and uh, they were told just to go up a bit higher until the um, uh, uh, pressure equalised. So anyway, um, off-base life at Ohaki, it wasn't all study. Um, and uh, as Dad says, uh, the women were able to come and visit. My wife and several other women in the same situation used to come to Palmerston North to stay at times in a private hotel. We could stay weekends for 10 shillings. I used to do my aerobatics high over the city, then glide back over the hotel and wave to the girls. Some people were very ready to complain about low-flying aircraft, but I found that if I kept the engine noise down, I could get away with anything. His um, instructor, uh, Flight Lieutenant Linkletter, who was the CO there, was also a farmer. And about once a week, um, he would choose Vern because he was a farmer as well. And they would head off to um, Whanganui. And they had a routine. And that would be they would... Um, uh, 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 fly low for some reason to scatter the sheep I'm not quite sure, perhaps hurting the sheep Dad talked about scatting then they would uh, stop for a comfort stop where Dad had to keep the motor going because apparently the hind didn't have a self starter and then they would get away again scattering some more sheep and uh, head back home anyway, after six weeks they uh, uh, Vern was moved to the air training school for advanced flying, so obviously he was doing well enough not to get kicked out. So This comprised gunnery, dogfighting tactics, bombing with practice bomb racks and night flying. This took us to the 10th of January and the Japanese threat was very real. With only 36 hours on Heinz, I was doing night readiness. We resurrected some queer looking first war bombs from some tunnels and fitted them to our practice bomb racks. We had one machine gun that fired through the prop, sometimes literally, and when a rumour came that a Jap aircraft carrier had been sighted near Napier, we were expected to go and sink it. Thank God it was not sighted again. Do what you have to. Anyway, after uh, six weeks and passing the Wings exam, uh, he came out 140th out of 200, which he felt was pretty good for a country boy, uh, up against you know the university types. But uh, there was no big um, celebration. There was no formal wings presentation as some outfits have. They were not even called wings, just flying badges. We were given a chit to take to stores where a surly AC2 gave us our wings and chevrons, or arm stripes, if commissioned. Anyway, it was getting close to time to be uh, commissioned and uh, my mother continues the story. I'll never forget the first time I saw him in uniform. He looked so handsome and I had a horrible feeling that he belonged to the Air Force and I only came second now. We certainly made the most of the time we had together. The final leave was very poignant and the farewell for Vern was held in the Pongakawa Hall which took all my strength to keep cheerful. I remember dear old Pop holding my hand when Old Lang Syne was sung. He squeezed my hand so hard, took my mind off everything. Not sure if it was to help himself or me. And so it came the time to leave for um, England. Now, um, Vernon Wren went to Auckland, um, where he was to board a ship called the, um, the Shore Sable, or it was a Shore Sable ship called the Waipawa. Now, due to secrecy, they couldn't be told the day when it was going to leave. And I think it was, ended up being about five days, and they um, had a routine where Dad would get all dressed ready to go. I never dared to look back each time. When the wharfies wished us good luck, we knew the boat was full and we would not go to shore again. As the last bit of New Zealand disappeared over the horizon, we really felt it. When I saw a big surly chap shedding tears, I was able to let go. I never shed another tear. Um, Mum was telling me that over this time, um, you know, she'd have to wait all day and then, you know, Dad would come back then go the next morning. So there was five days of coming and going, and then one day he just didn't come back. 
Anyway, this is just a little thing I picked up from, um, I think it's uh, either mum or dad's uh, autograph book. Who remembers autograph books? And um, one of her uh, cousins was also, uh, he was a cartoonist, and I, I love this picture, so I thought I'd throw it in there just for the hell of it. Uh, my mother was by that time pregnant with my oldest brother, Tony, um, but dad wouldn't get to see him for over three and a half years. On the, um, the ship, um, they spent their time um, reading, um, doing gun drills and submarine watch. Anyway, they finally arrived in um, Belfast. Uh, Dad remarked that it um, looked a bit like um, uh, Tipuki sail yards, mud everywhere and so on, because they didn't have gumboots, they kept out of the way. Anyway, they boarded the ferry across to uh, England and then by train to Bournemouth to the number three personal reception centre. Interesting experience, meeting class structures. New Zealand's pretty egalitarian. And uh, here's Dad with the story. The CO rounded up our officers and told them they'd been seen fraternising with sergeant pilots and backslapping in the streets, and it was to cease forthwith. Their responses nearly gave him a heart attack. It was a Aussie who yelled out bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after uh, uh, several months, he went on to Harrogate. This is the Harrogate Hotel. They had plenty of lectures, but according to Dad, they actually spent more time playing golf at that time. Uh, interesting thing was that they were paid 11 shillings a day, of which four shillings had to be sent home. Whereas Dad said he kept four and sent seven home. Um, he said when he arrived in Britain, beer was eight pence a pint. And when he left, it was um, one and four pence. But his pay had gone up to 22 shillings. So not much to live on, I'm afraid. Anyway, he was then posted to um, uh, the air flight unit at Watton in Norfolk, where he, they were flying uh, Miles Masters. I landed my first master so hard it had to go for inspection to see if the undercard had been damaged. The instructor asked what I had been trained on. When I said Heinz, he understood. When you level out in a biplane without motor, it responds. A monoplane turns up its nose and keeps going down. I'd done a high-speed stall. The next posting was the major one. This was to Grangemouth up in Scotland um, <clears throat> and brought him closer to his um, uh, desire to fly a Spitfire. I arrived in Grangemouth in heavy fog, which did not lift for a fortnight. There were no barracks. We were billeted with private families. It was December 1942 in midwinter when I started finding my way around. The snow had turned to ice, and riding my bike on the uneven surface was dangerous. After two weeks, the fog and um, uh, with fog and sub-zero temperatures, suddenly the sun came out to reveal hangars and Spitfires um, all all parked around. My dream was coming true at last. After a check duel and a Master Three, I was sent off in a Spitfire. So anyway, here's a um, entry from uh, Dad's logbook. Um, which we've um, got here if anyone wants to, to look at afterwards. Um, and also his um, diary. Um, being a farmer, he kept a diary. That's what farmers do. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's listed there. Today is such a great day. So, is, is the great day of my life. I've flown a spit. I had 45 minutes and it was lovely. Um, and then he mentioned also the second great event was the arrival of letters from DRN telling me about the birth of our son Tony. So something was going on there. Anyway, his comments about the Spitfire. The Spitfire was so beautiful to handle. I can only compare it with the North American Mustang and the Hawker Tempest, which I flew later on in the war. Our exercises consisted of formation flying, aerobatics, navigation exercises, and air-to-air -air and air-to-ground gunnery. So this is the class photo. Now, um, by looking at the names, half of them were Polish. 
um, and Dad had great things to say about them. Um, in an interesting situation about oh, six or seven years ago, um, I'd put some of my family's history online and a son of one of the other Polish pilots contacted me and we exchanged photos and other memorabilia that uh, each of us had that the other didn't. Um, but there was a sad side, unfortunately, his father had died in 45 in a peacetime accident. Um, so um, um, he never got to know his father. Um, anyway, in um, Grangemouth, he was billeted with um, the Wilkies, who treated him like a son and um, even organised another motorbike. I told you there were motorbikes in there as well. There are a variety of um, uh, incidents um, uh, there. Uh, one day he uh, forgot to close the side door on the, the Spitfire and the canopy blew off uh, and took a hunk of flesh off his shoulder. It also lent a, so put a dent in the tailplane. Um, as he climbed, the bleeding stopped and the blood froze. Um, the plane damage was minimal, so he wasn't penalised. But uh, I love the story he says about the chap who had his, part of his rump grafted onto his face and it gave him a great thrill every time he kissed his mother-in-law. <laughs> so having completed the training, he was then assigned to 501 Squadron, which was an RAF squadron. Um, his... Um, one of his best mates um, was put, um, uh, assigned to 485, which was the, RN, the main RNCDF squadron. So um, they were sent to Ballyhalbert in Ireland, and at that time the squadron was resting. Resting was a situation where um, after a squadron had been active for a while and lost a lot of people and planes, they would go somewhere remote and they would bring in new blood, um, get equipped with new aircraft and uh, train the, um, the, new, the new bods. Our first mission was for five days and included two convoy jobs. The first was to cover a lone ship. It was either the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth. She travelled alone as no other boat could keep up with her. She looked huge. The other job was a convoy, at least 10 miles long. Each boat had its balloon and the viz was so bad it was difficult to know when we were at the end. And it was very easy to lose them altogether. I was getting a boil in my nether regions when we went and the trip back was terrible. Sitting on one cheek in the small cockpit of a Spitfire. There were not enough um, aircraft to go around um, at that time. And um, one day it was, uh, he was assigned to... Um, fly with a chap who no one else would fly with. Who's seen that ad on TV about the, uh, the guy in the ute, the V8, and no one wants to drive, drive with him to work? I think, I think it's that situation. Anyway, um, uh, they got a bit of wind and take off, and um, instead of having another go, apparently the guy persisted and uh, went downwind and stalled from about 100 feet. And um, wasn't good. He ended up uh, in hospital, um, and uh, he never flew with that chap again. Dad often spoke about the experience of what it was like um, living day to day, not knowing whether you know you were going to uh, still be there the next day. And he, he he spoke about what it was like turning up to the mess where they had the the big blackboard with all of the uh, the names and assignations and what they were doing and how um, it was not uncommon for a chalk to go through a name and then the next day it was gone. We lived in very civilised conditions, but you were either very alive or dead and the transition was usually very swift. And there were a couple of incidents that he, he spoke about that I think affected him. One master doing night circuits and bumps at Watton stalled on approach and burned. It was 2am. I saw the pilot leave as I started my night flying supper of bacon and eggs. When I heard the sickening thud, his plate was still on the table, with his own special jam. He reckoned the Air Force stuff was not fit to eat. The wafts were all crying, and it was very upsetting. 
and uh, in 501. I lost three roommates in 501 and later with the ferrying squadron. One was killed when the whole squadron was flying line abreast. There was to be a safe distance between the two flights and it spread out a bit and the right hand man of the team at the left and the left hand man of the right flight converged and collided. Each was looking the other way. So this, this I think was um, B flight uh, in the 501. Uh, there were two pilots returning um, at sea level and it was customary to fly about uh, 50 yards apart from each other um, and uh, guarding each other's ta um, tail. And uh, Dad said, you know, um, the chap looked left and right. There was his mate to look left, look right, and this guy was gone. And his comment was, Spitfires don't float. Hence the top uh, title for this uh, talk. He went on to um, Hawkinge, um, which had been a, a, a fighter drone in the First World War. Um, and um, they were told to keep uh, below enemy radar, which meant flying at 50 feet or less. Um, and often coming back, they'd be scraping the white cliffs of Dover. Apparently there was plenty of ground fire every time they were airborne. Um, but he said he never had to fire his guns in anger. And as I'll talk later on, sometimes the air fire was not over in France. It was the Dad's army. <laughs> anyway, things didn't always go so well. And I like, I like, this is one of those days you just really wouldn't want to wake up. Today I've broken a record. I've done over seven hours flying, including an hour 15 night flying. Also... I had more things go wrong than ever before. I flew too near a convoy and got bollocked. Then I took up the wrong kite and got bollocked again. Then I made a bad landing on the wrong runway. Got fined half a crown for attempting to land, another for actually landing on said runway, and another half a crown for taxiing with my flaps down. Now, uh, Dad was quite a bit older. He was 24 years old, and most of these other pilots were 18, 19 years of age. So he was known as the old man. Um, there was the other comment I came across that he said the, um, the only thing more dangerous than the Yanks were the British coastal batteries. They were reputed to fire at anything uh, that crossed the coast. So, um, yep, a bit of a problem there. And just as a, uh, an interesting thing, I came across one of his things, the states of readiness um, uh, at a fighter station. Half hour meant you had to be on station within the range of a phone. Five minutes meant in the crew room, but not in your May West. Instant was dressed and ready, and when the whistle blew, it usually took 90 seconds to run to the plane and get airborne. It's pretty quick. And the final, final state was actually sitting in, uh, and it took 15 seconds to, to leave the ground. So you would certainly hope the, the engine would start, wouldn't you? Now, there was one interesting story um, that I thought uh, you'd be interested in. It was to do with um, an issue with the Spitfires that they had. Um, uh, they were using 90-gallon drop tanks. Now, I researched this, and I think this is it. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name. It was something like Braffin uh, drop tanks. So anyway, I'll let Dad tell the story. I just switched to drop tank when my motor cut. I was going flat out on the deck about 300 mile an hour. I came back on the main tank and sent out a mayday and climbed to 2,000 feet preparatory to bailing out. A Spitfire does not ditch very well. I pulled my radio plug so as not to hang myself and was unstrapped and halfway out when the motor started up with a roar. What a relief. I've never contemplated bailing out for fun. I'm too cowardly. But on this occasion I felt no fear. My Canadian mate was comforting me and telling me he would stay with me until the farting duck arrived. We had already lost two planes over France with this problem, so I kept the tank on and did the most gentle landing of my life. The mechanics solved the airlocking trouble and we lost no more planes. Anyway, um, the farting duck. Um, this was the um, Walrus. It was a biplane with a pusher prop driven by an um, engine on top um, and it made the most amazing spluttering noises which gave it the, the nickname the farting duck. 
uh, it could land in fairly rough seas but not always take off, so often um, uh, it had to motor back um, uh, to get back home. And after one such thing where they had um, picked up someone who didn't survive, um, they arrived fairly tired, so they just uh, uh, moored the plane and um, went to sleep. But apparently it was quite a common place for um, pilots or airmen and WAFs to use the comfortable accommodations in the plane for hooking up, as they would say today. Um, uh, one night apparently all was fine until the WAF realised that there were more arms and legs than there should be in the bed. <laughs> According to Dad, she had to be treated by a doctor for hysteria. Dad made his last flight with um, uh, 501 Christmas 43. He actually had a cold. He was not meant to fly, but someone apparently had a hard night the night before and was even worse. So Dad went up in this place and it was a high altitude um, uh, reconnaissance mission uh, over France, which should have been, as he says, um, uh, a milk run. But right at the extremity of the trip, they got advised that there were um, uh, enemy planes coming towards them, 30 of them. So there were two, two, 30 against two, 15 to one. Um, and as he said, when you're in enemy country, uh, it's not a time to fight. You turn tail and head to home. He was um, not worse for wear uh, that night, but aside that day, or well, the rest of the day, but he woke at night in excruciating pain with blood pouring out of his ear. He was rushed to hospital and for the next five days um, was in um, such pain that he, he couldn't sleep or eat. But then... Suddenly I went to sleep. And when I woke I was starving and thirsty. The girls kept bringing me sandwiches and cups of tea. Yes, so he had a medical examination after that and uh, sadly he got... Um, limited to 6,000 feet, which meant that, that he, he had to leave the squadron. Just a little bit of, uh, about the life back home. Um, and I'm going to uh, bring in my mother's story here. This is one of her paintings, which I liked. It was good to have Tony and I to live with Nan and Pop, as my mother had died when I was only 16 years old. I was the only one in the maternity home without a husband nearby. Matron Lenehan was very kind. We had to stay there for two weeks, and in those days it was the in thing to ensure we were fit enough and used to the baby. Life had its ups and downs with the little fella when witnessing his first smiles and his first steps. We did patriotic work running dances and providing goods for the patriotic shop in town. There was rationing for many things including petrol and coupons for clothing. We kept sending Red Cross parcels of food, etc., carefully sewn up in calico material. I used to make Afghan biscuits for Vern, his favourite, and tobacco, of course. They really looked forward to their parcels. So one of the things for communications, they um, used aerographs. Um, it was a thing developed by the um, uh, Kodak, I think it was, in America, where you wrote your letter, then it was photographed, and they sent the, like microfilm, and they sent that. And apparently it saved a huge amount of weight on the aeroplanes coming back and, um, and uh, forward. In the end, Dad got assigned to the air delivery wing, which operated in conjunction with the ATA, which was the civilian organisation where uh, it was very often women uh, flying. This was um, his first flight. Today dawned fine and I got my first job. Nine of us set off in the Domini, and we were dropped off at various points. I naturally was at Hawkinge and took one of the 501 kites to Exeter and brought a Spit 7 back to West Melling near Maidstone. It's 200 miles each way. It was a wizard. I came back from West Melling in the Domini. In the air delivery flight, they had a lot of power um, compared to being a, a junior in the squadron. Uh, Dad said he could authorise his own flights, um, take a plane when he wanted to go on holiday, um, take a train back, of course, and uh, as he said, I could fly anywhere as though I uh, owned the place. Um, Croydon had to, um, well, they had to leave Croydon and because uh, it was so close to London, and there were lots of barrage balloons, and 
He did mention at times that he had some uncomfortable experiences in bad weather, having a big black thing go past. <laughs> I'm just going to shoot across to D-Day. And um, he saw, well, certainly the, the English side of that from the air. Interestingly enough, over that period, there's no entries in his diary. And uh, he said it wasn't because they were not allowed to record anything. It was just that they were so busy uh, positioning um, aircraft. OK, uh, there's some miscellaneous here. This is one of the maps, if you want to pass that around. They would have that in the plane and would fold up and have between their knees so they could get back. And later on, I've got all of his other maps of anyone's interested in, which has a lot of Europe and, and England. So I'm sort of glad my dad was a bit of a hoarder like me. The other thing that uh, I can show, um, this is his kit bag with his boots, uh, with the goggles and the helmet. And I was talking to some of the others and thought it would perhaps be a good idea to try and get the repair shop in England to do a job on <laughs> Um, his flight jacket's gone, unfortunately, but I still also have his uniform and cap, and of course wings. And um, just want to mention the ensign. It was a, a good story Dad told that um, he decided that it was time to fly a plane with um, two motors. So he took this job, and um, the first flight in it, he had uh, seven passengers. And he said after... <laughs> After 15 minutes of reading the manual, some of the passengers were lo looking decidedly uncomfortable. <laughs> um, there was an interesting side to this. Um, uh, this is Dad's cousin, um, Harold Ford from uh, Nelson uh, in Bill Reed's Restored Anson. And this was a photo that was um, apparently in the local paper. Uh, Harold went to Canada where they were training the pilots, but because of his age, he was behind Dad, and um, the war ended before they got um, shipped to, um, to Europe. Eventually, uh, he got commissioned, but literally, straight away, he got repatri repatriated. That was the end of um, 1944, and so he um, spun wheels for a, a month or so, and then made at home. And um, there's an interesting story from my mother as to how that turned out. Well, strangely, I had been so excited before, but when we actually met again, I had no feelings at all. I was just a zombie. This wasn't the same man I had married. He had grown much bigger, needed a shave badly, and was wearing those huge great coats of the Air Force. Back at the Stonehurst Hotel, Lots of strange people came up to shake his hand to welcome him back. After a clean-up and breakfast, we started to thaw out. What a big adjustment for both of us with three and a half years separation, with Vern's war experiences and me having grown up considerably. War does dreadful things to people's lives. So for me, in reviewing this, I mean, quite an amazing experience for a Pongakawa boy on a farm. Um, not only learning to fly, but um, flying what was then the most uh, powerful fighters of the, the time, um, you know, the, the top guns of World War II, and to make it back in, in one piece. <laughs> the day he got back, <laughs> it was back to the farm. <laughs> he said he was back drafting sheep and feeding out hay. But um, the passion was still there. But apart from the odd um, trip up with Eric Club mates, uh, he never flew again, uh, except for the odd trip with the uh, top dressing pilot. Um, they would have this seat that would fit in the hopper. So if they were working on a job away from the airfield, they would bring the hopper driver back. So there was this little seat. So Dad would con the uh, pilot. He'd say, I flew Spitfires, and of course that opened doors. <laughs> and he would get a trip around the farm. Uh, in the um, top dressing aeroplanes. But the um, passion never left him, and he used to bring us here, because uh, during our 
school holidays we would camp at the Mount, but Dad would love coming here and just sitting at the airport. And literally, because there was a big hangar here at that particular time, if anyone from the area remembers. And um, we would just sit and watch the planes taking off. I had one funny experience. My brother Morris had come home from on holiday. He had his private pilot's license, and he took Dad and my younger brother and I up in a 172, and we taxied out, we're about to take off, and... Um, in a 172, you open the throttle full to take off. My dad's instant reaction was to <laughs> stop it. And so the, the plane, you know, throttles up and then stops like this. And um, they're both looking at each other. And dad suddenly, you know, it only took about a second or perhaps even less to realise he had done something wrong. But he said, in a Spitfire, if you did that, the engine would disconnect and take off on its own down the runway. <laughs> My mother, for those of who perhaps come across her, was a very prolific painter. She painted about 5,000 uh, pieces of work, but she never painted aeroplanes. Well, there was actually one. This is a mural out at Pongakawa School, and you can just see up there. That's the only aeroplane I've ever seen her paint. But uh, my brother Morris um, got into this, and this he painted when he was about 19. So he had the passion as well. Anyway, Dad went on to um, help set up the Bay of Plenty branch of the Fighter Pilots Association. Anyway, they used to meet on the uh, Battle of Britain um, Day, which is 15th of September, which just so happened to be my birthday. And uh, so a tradition happened. I would come home with the family and um, I'd toddle off with Dad and help him um, organise the day. It was an interesting experience because... I found that if I ever approached a group who were talking, I realised that the conversation would suddenly change in my presence. You know, quantum mechanics, the observer affects the observed. Anyway, um, after about four years, that stopped happening. I was sort of accepted as um, uh, one of them. And um, I realised that these meetings were so important as therapy, as they were still dealing with a lot of the emotional experiences that they'd had. Um, they could not ever talk to anyone else. Um, and in my own experience in life and com in other situations, I've come to experience that. Another day I set up a flight simulator um, and it was most interesting to see how some just hopped in it and they were, they were back flying, fighting, shooting. Others a little more tentative and some others just didn't want to touch it. So interesting experience. Uh, we had Sir Tim Wallace um, lined up. Dad and I had been down to Wanaka to Warbirds uh, uh, over or wings over uh, Wanaka, and um, Dad had um, got talking to Tim Wallace and organised him to come and talk uh, at one of their meetings. Anyway, the day of 15th of September arrived, and um, about an hour out, Dad said, "Oh, I haven't heard from Sir Tim." And I said, "I think we better sort something out." So I got on the phone and found out. Um, he'd just got back from Russia. He was picking up, um, what were they, uh, Polykarpovs, that's right, from the ice. Uh, anyway, um, I got his office and they said, oh, no, he's just come back from Russia, but he's in the Christchurch office and they patched me through. And I explained it, the situation to Sir Tim and he says, oh, that explains it. He says, I wrote something in my diary, but I didn't put any details. <laughs> and he says, look, if, you got, if you'd got hold of me and... A couple of hours earlier, I would have hopped on a plane and got up there. But I said, well, as second best, can you give a talk over the radio, uh, over the telephone? And he said, OK. So I shot down to the local shop, got one of these speaker phones, and at the SITS club, we plugged it in, hooked that uh, microphone from the, the PA system over it, and he spoke for 45 minutes, the, one of the most amazing talks that I've ever heard. Uh, I wish we could have filmed that, actually. That would have been amazing. When Sir Tim um, had his crash, um, I rang my dad straight away, uh, 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 rang about it, and dad said straight away he had the trim wrong because it was the Griffin engine which went the other way around and you had to set the trim wrong, uh, the other way around. And that was Sir Tim's second Spitfire and, of course, something didn't happen. Byrne passed away in 2002 at the age of 85. Um, even though he had given up smoking, emphysema and the steroids they gave him, 
conspired to end his life. But it's important to understand that my father wasn't a war hero from the point of view of you know the people with kills marked on the side of an aircraft. Um, he he wasn't that sort of person. And he told me that when he got back and his feet were back on the soil here, that he, he thanked God that he'd never been put in a position to you know kill another person. You know, he wasn't that sort of person. But he'd had a passion from a very young age, desire to fly, and the war simply gave him that opportunity. So anyway, thank you for listening tonight, and uh, yes, I'm within my hour. So, any questions? Gary, the, he flew Tempest, I think you said. Um, I think he flew practically everything yeah, um, <laughs> that there was. They, won't come, they just flew them at, like on delivery. It, yeah, it was a delivery flight. He said that in the ADF, that's where he really learned to fly. Right. Uh, uh, um, uh, no, no, he wasn't. A, no, it was ADF, air delivery flight, which was the military wing. The ATA was the civilian wing. Yep. Oh, yep. So ADF, air delivery flight. I, don't worry, I had to sort it out in my own mind because I thought it was ATA until I read, reread his um, notes and then researched it. And the, um, so they had the military wing and the civilian wing. And, um, and there, basically, it was, an op- uh, as he said, he learned to fly because every day they were flying something else in all different situations. And he said it was actually more dangerous than being in 501 because the 501, most of it was, as he said, milk runs, you know, um, reconnaissance or uh, meteorological uh, uh, trips. It, it was very rare that they actually got into combat. You know, we sort of think you, know, you go in the Air Force and, and all you're doing is going up and dogfighting. Uh, there was very little of that. But the air delivery flight, they were very often flying uh, crippled planes to get fixed, um, <laughs> which, you know, had its challenges, or positioning fixed or repaired or new planes to in bad weather, so when the weather was fine, they could be used. And he, the thing about the barrage balloons, you know, he said often, you know, you in bad weather, because they had them all over the place, and, and while they were meant to be documented, documentation was not always up to date. So he would have done, in his spare time, he would No, no. And that's where the ADF, I think, they came with military training. And that's why the mathematics came in. Um, you know, not only to be flying by instrument, but to, to be able to navigate. And he seemed to have a, a knack for it. He, he said, you know, he, he invariably ended up where he wanted to be. And I, I think that would have come from the training, you know, that um, it sort of builds into your thinking and um, the decisions that you make. Um, because a lot of the um, civilian pilots, they were just um, drive, drivers. I, I'm not to demean them, but their training was just to drive these things to get them from one place to the other. Yeah. Mm. Well, you have to understand, I guess, at wartime, it's a matter of resources. You know, they needed people, and this was the minimum required. No, it was still dangerous. Yeah. They didn't encounter an enemy. Yeah, well, they, they were only flying within England. So they. Oh, yeah, but quite yeah. often yeah. there were uh, all yeah. of enemy aircraft yeah. flying around. Yeah. But if they, if they were, they were usually being um, followed by a, a, a fighter squadron, you know. Um, and I, I would say that with the radar that they had, they had a. You know, they knew they were, they were coming, and so um, if you're doing a delivery flight, um, what was the one, 200 miles? That would be less than an hour. So, you know, um, the likelihood of an, uh, a civilian pilot 
getting caught up would be low. Hey, can't say it didn't happen, but it's like we, we think of the war period, you know, of a lot of fighting, but there were long periods where there was nothing. It's, it's like in the Ukraine at the moment where, um, you know, it's winter, so, so there's very little fighting going on because it's just so darn cold, everything's frozen. You know, antifreeze or not, you know, uh, things just don't work. Well, the First World War, there were long periods of inaction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they got themselves sorted. Mm. Yep. Yep. And, and this was one of the things that when I started looking through my dad's diaries and things, you know, long periods with nothing much. He was a very good billiard player, by the way, <laughs> and, a, and a good dancer. Um, so, um, you know, they had to occupy themselves in, in, in ways. Um, he got into model making because they had to do something to do. Well, they had to have something to do, you know. Meanwhile, back in Pongakawa. So I, I, I wanted to put my mother's story in because... But back in Pongakawa, all the guys that left Pongakawa and went to the war, they were sort of the heroes. Little did we know that Vern Benner was having fun up there. What I mean is, yeah. I can remember my auntie. She, she's still going quite, you know, strong, got all her muscles. Mm. She's 90, 95, but she mentions all the names of the guys, including your father, that went to war. Mm. Well, the community was really much uh, behind them, and the food parcels that I, I mentioned, um, that was a big community thing, that to get um, um, treats, because there weren't... I mean, as, as Dad said, he was, you know, living on four shillings a week. You know, so... My, my father-in-law was on the Achilles during the war. When he went away... He, uh, his wife, his wife at the time, made him a cake. Oh, that was a lovely cake. He actually hated it, but she kept making them and sending them. And when he got them, the Achilles had given them to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there, there are lots of stories uh, like that, um, and and they got to bartering and things like that. Um, and um, I mentioned about when he was in Grangemouth, um, the family there that sort of you know. Um, not adopted him, but treated him like a son. He w- he actually went would go up and visit them when he was particularly in the ADF. He'd fly up, up to Grangemouth and um, you know uh, spend a long weekend there with them. And um, you know he had use of a vehicle, a motorbike, and um, you know it was like you know uh, being back home a wee bit. I think what you touched on earlier, uh, Gary, about your dad, um, about the talent. Um, to navigate unfamiliar aircraft mm. across southern England, which I can tell you, so much of it is just featureless. Mm. Well, a, a complication was the towns. Um, they had to identify them by the railway lines because all identification was removed from the air was removed. And um, often they had to... Um, uh, look up some record of you know of the the railway lines coming in and what direction to identify the town. So they had to have this knowledge um, to um, you know um, to get uh, to get around. You know, which, so um, yeah, I mean challenges we just can't imagine. You know, and it could go on because you know they came back to Pongakawa. Yeah. Uh, where uh, there must have been times that he wondered what he was doing. Yeah, uh, yeah. the um, um, as I alluded to, he had two, you know, two passions. Obviously, you know, he, he really loved mum, um, and I've seen some of the letters, you know, and obviously um, that was very strong. But his passion for flying and going to the ADF was something that was actually a benefit for him because he got to fly um, so many different planes in, in different places and, and got to fly all over England and, as a, you know, as I said, you know, take his holidays in places. So uh, he got to know the place pretty well. Gary, what, um, what age was that photo taken of your dad? Um, that's actually, that photo um, is taken from his ID photo, which is about that big. I scanned it and it's a composite of three photographs, um, one um, with the clouds and one with the uh, con- uh, control tower. 
Um, so and the medals or the, the under his wings. Um, that's that that would that being that would have been taken in New Zealand. Um, and um, uh, because that formed his ID card, which I think was issued. Actually, do I? Because they, you know, um, uh, Kiwi pilots would have got the whole range of medals, but. Uh, yeah, no, that that was definitely early on. It it was, I mean, he's got the yeah. medals and things. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I've got them. Yep. Uh, medals are important, just as a, another little aside, at Pongakawa School. Pongakawa School was um, founded in 1892, and the first six pupils were Benners. <laughs> we were the original settlers out there. And um, one of Dad's great uncles, um, uh, another Albert, but known as Bert Benner, uh, was killed at Gallipoli at Chanak Beer. And so he's on the gates of the school and so on. And while doing some research on him, I came across on Trade Me, someone was selling his medal, or one of his medals. How it got there, I don't know. Well, being single, there was no children, so it would have been someone in the family and just didn't consider it. Um, the record, though, was for a sale that had gone ahead. It was an expired sale. Google had picked up. So over, it took me, I think, about between five and seven years because I had to track, I first tracked down the seller, but Trade Me doesn't allow you to just talk to someone. I had to wait until I, he was making another sale, and then I used the comments <laughs> to say, hey, regarding this thing that you sold, can you please email me? Anyway, it took him about two years to get back to me. <laughs> and then another emails going backwards and forwards, you know, trying to explain why I'm doing this. And he eventually told me who he had sold it to. And so I started emailing that guy and never got replies for about three years, three or four years. And suddenly got an email back from him and said, look, I've just seen your email. Uh, he'd been, he was a senior um, uh, officer in the Navy and had been assigned to a job in Beijing. So go figure. And he said, look, great story. I'll sell it to you at the price I paid for it. So we, um, we got the medal and I got it mounted in a case with a um, little story about it, and it's now sitting in the main office at Pongakawa School. Because otherwise, where do, what happens to them? They just sit in someone's drawer and then end up on Trade Me again. So um, I'm hoping that if I can get my dad's stuff, um, including his medals, um, to um, produce a little diorama or something for here, or to be part of the system, because I've got Everything. There's uniform, the kit bag, uh, and we've got his book. I'm sorry, I thought I had uh, more copies of his book, um, but I gave them the ones I had. I gave away at the last last time I gave the talk. But if anyone's interested, I've got the book scanned uh, in PDF, and um, Mike, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, a link if anyone wants to download it because there's a, a lot more, some that I would have a little difficulty talking about, but. You know, um, you'll you'll get the the idea. Did your dad fly when he got home again? Yeah. That was a, the thing. Is his his own father was um, not well, and the family needed to be supported. Not only you know my mother and and the, my brothers, but um, his parents, and so the op any resource that they had had to go into that. He was a member of the Aero Club. Um, he was a, a good friend of Brian Cox, um, who was also related to uh, my mother, uh, his family. And um, so he used to go on, they used to go on trips and they would all take a time at the controls. He said that was not always a pleasant experience. <laughs> See, one of the reasons uh, I asked in the 50s, 60s, you had the photo of the Polish pilots. Yep. One of the aviation inspectors here was a chap called uh, Tony Glowacki. He's yep. Polish. Yep. And that's why I asked. I wanted oh, right. To no time. Yep. No, n n not that Dad was aware of. But bear in mind, back then, you know, we didn't have the internet, you know, the ability to contact people, you know, un unless you actually knew um, 
you know, someone to contact. Um, um, it, it would have been difficult, uh, I'm sure. I mean, he, he would have loved to have flown, but um, I think he would have come across the same decision as, as I did, was um, when, when eventually, um, you know, I was free of family responsibilities. Oh, should I, now I got my heart issues sorted. But I, I, I decided that it was easier to give my mates the 150 bucks and for them to take me up, okay? And they would, um, I remember flying a 180 from five minutes out of North Shore all the way down to New Plymouth, you know, so I, I, I've had a bit of fun. Uh, but because of the age and, and the an inability to put the attention to it, you can't make mistakes when you're in the air. You know, if you're driving or riding a motorbike, you've got a chance of getting away with it. But if you make a mistake in the air, it, and, and it was a conscious decision on my part to um, defer to my uh, 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 friends who, who I trusted. Interesting point, sorry, John. Um, interesting point you, Bruce, sorry. Interesting point you made about pilots not wanting to fly again. Yeah. Years ago, when I was flying out of Christchurch, a friend said, Oh, got this ex um, RF pilot who used to fly similar mm. to your dad. Yeah. Did you take so I took him for a fly? Yeah. Said, oh, you know, do, you, do you want to take? Oh, no, no, he said, oh, no, no. He didn't, he, didn't want to, he didn't want to take control, so he was just happy to fly. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. So, and the thing with the flight simulator, I, I was quite surprised. I, I thought I'd be beating them all off. Well, there was three of them who, you know, I had to say, you know, you know, let someone else have a go. But there are others that we'd sort of bemused more from the computing thing. But there are others I could tell it wasn't to do with the computer. And, you know, whether it was some bad experience or bad memory or feeling of uh, fear that if they mis made a mistake on the computer, they would crash the computer, you know, physically. <laughs> Who knows, you know. But, uh, Linton. Talking about your father, um, with his uh, ear problem, uh, yep. that uh, didn't ground him, but restricted yep. his... 6,000 feet, 6, yeah. 6,000 feet, and pressurisation, things like that. Um, but uh, and I guess that medical expertise at the time didn't allow it to be repaired if it is repairable. Yeah. With time, as time went on, yep. and clear of the stresses of war and yep. the call on medical mm. facilities mm. and uh, increasing knowledge of medical procedures, mm. was uh, did he ever get back to normal? Yep, uh, uh, um, I thought I mentioned right at the end, just before he came back uh, in '44, about November '44, um, he had his full license uh, restored, but. He literally, well, there were three things. There was that, he got his commission, and then his repatriation orders. Because by the end of '44, well, he'd had that time away. I think that would have been a factor. But I think also, um, um, you know, there was less need. Otherwise, you know, they would have kept on, kept him on, I'm sure. But the ear problem didn't raise its head again? No. So he could hear all right? Yeah, yeah. Going back to the Pulse, uh, in my early days in the New Zealand, we had this crusty old uh, Kiwi bomber pilot who'd uh, been up against the Luftwaffe over Germany yep. many, many times. But he said the hardest bit was getting back to England past the Polish fighter squadrons. Yeah. Because they would shoot at anything that was up in the sky. Yeah, yeah. Well, well Dad said that the, um, the coastal batteries as well. Be, they, they, they know how to fly an aeroplane, so surely they must uh, be able to distinguish between different aircraft types. They're not stupid. They're, you know, they're highly intelligent people. Well, so well Dad, Dad had a great disdain of the Americans. Oh, yeah. You know, um, he, he, he was more afraid of the Americans than the Germans in, in the air. And, and then the, the worst, he says, were the coastal batteries. And despite, uh, he talked about one day that his CO made a special trip over to talk to them. And, um, you know, basically, you know, there was no change, you know, and he couldn't talk any sense into them. Here, one of the things that Dad used to do was to teach us to recognise aeroplanes by the sounds of the engines. Because there, you know, 
Or have you seen those big, a um, uh, bit like his master's voice uh, tube things? And they've had big tubes coming down to an ear. Um, and they used to use those to recognize the sound of the engines. And Dad, I mean, you know, we would sort of pick up between a 172 and an error commander and, hey, you know, pretty basic stuff for 10 year old kids. There's the last lark with uh, Jack Shorthouse. Uh, before we got the 74 simulator, we had to do a training with Qantas in Sydney. Yep. And we were there for two months, and he was the lead simulator instructor. Mm. And we were staying in an apartment complex in Edgecliff above uh, uh, Crosscutters Bay. And the guy in charge of the uh, accommodation was ex Luftwaffe. <laughs> so, uh, and he was all good natured, but it, oh, yeah. it, was, it was funny as a fight. Let's see these two go. Look, I had a similar experience, um, if I can say this. I was dealing in business with a, he was slightly older, Austrian. And after about, I think, three meetings, um, we were having lunch together, and uh, I said, um, um, I'm not quite what you feel, it, but quite what you think about it. Uh, but my father was a Spitfire pilot in World War II. And he laughs, and I'm thinking, what this? And he says, my father was in the Luftwaffe. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing about the pilots was that um, they were gentlemen. And I, I think that, uh, like the Luftwaffe used to run their own camps for downed airmen. Um, and um, uh, there was a thing, when my father died, we had his funeral at um, the um, Anglican Church in Te Puki, and the RSA wanted to play the last post and things. My mother didn't want to hear the last post, she couldn't handle that. But they did a ceremony outside where they, you know, all put a, 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 a sprig from some tree on the coffin. And they read out this thing, and the guy starts off, uh, soldier, you've fought your last battle. And my brothers and I looked at each other, Dad wasn't a soldier, <laughs> he was a pilot. <laughs> so there was a different class structure there. And uh, The Air Force hasn't got an equivalent uh, casket. Uh, ceremony, yeah. And um, never had. Yeah. the soldier one is what you have. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But the RSA, I remember on Friday nights, um, I used to get uh, going with Dad. I'd get sent to Bible class things for you know communion or you know being confirmed or whatever. And Dad would go down to the RSA, and then when I was finished, I'd walk down there and have to knock on the door, and you know, a little window opened up. Yes, <laughs> and you could just see you know the billiard tables. But Dad always used, uh, you know, there was therapy. You know, as I was saying before, like the fighter pilot cessation, they needed that because I'm sure, certainly from what I eventually started to hear them talk about, you know, they, were, they went through experiences that, you know, were horrendous, you know, that they, or that they did things that they weren't happy to be able to say that they did, you know, because it was wartime. And it was only with others who were there that they could talk about it. And um, um, I remember one poignant experience. He had a friend who came to visit once, and the dad was about 80-something at the time. And they went off for a walk around. Dad had a little golf cart thing he used to run around the, the orchard. And, and um, th this chap didn't look that happy, and, and dad was saying, you know, he was having to talk with him because th this chap had been an ace. You know, he'd actually shot down other aeroplanes, whereas Dad had never. And this guy had, in his later years, started to have, you know, see the faces of the guys that he'd shot down in his dreams. And, you know, it was all coming up. And, um, you know, Dad explained that's why they were out in the orchard for 45 minutes to an hour, you know, um, talking that stuff through. So, um, horrendous experience. Hmm. Anyway, press the button. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. My pleasure.